the Lincolnian constitutional tradition provide, other than Supreme Court and, um, well, there are two. National elections, throw the rascals out, and constitutional amendments. The people can amend the Constitution. So what's the problem? It's a real big problem. Article 5 of the Constitution lays out two ways to propose amendments to the Constitution. First, if two-thirds of both houses of Congress agree, an amendment is sent to the states. Now, how likely is that? Well, from 1790 until today, there have been over 10,000 amendments proposed to Congress. Only 30 have been sent to the states. And 27 have passed. It is practically impossible to float an amendment to limit Congress's power over the states. It's not impossible, but it's practically impossible. The second way of amendments is more promising, and that is through the states themselves. If two-thirds of the states request it, two-thirds, Congress must call a constitutional convention to, quote, consider amendments. This method, however, has never been tried, mainly because people are afraid of what an open convention could do. Nor can such a convention be called, and this is an important point, until Congress passes the enabling legislation that would define the convention's procedure. It is astonishing but true that from 1790 until today, Congress has refused to pass the legislation that would enable the states to propose amendments. So they have virtually no way to, to effectively propose amendments. But that did not have to happen. In the original draft of Article 5, written by James Madison, the states could propose amendments for ratification directly. If two-thirds approved, Congress had to send the, rat the, the amendment down for ratification. For some reason, that was changed at the 59th minute of the 11th hour for reasons that are still obscure. It is worth observing that this defect in the U.S. Constitution was remedied in the Confederate Constitution, which provided that only three states were needed to propose an amendment. But of any states, any three could just propose an amendment, and the others would have to vote it up or down. This shows respect for state sovereignty. And in the Confederate Constitution, only two-thirds of the states were needed to ratify, not three-quarters. So it was a much more democratic and flexible uh, system. And it was a form of state nullification. The states initiated, they blocked. The final method offered by Lincoln and his tradition for checking and lawful action of the national election. Um, what we need to consider, given the massive centralization in Washington and the fact that over 90% of incumbents are re-elected, there's, there's something bad in the middle somewhere. And let me explain one of the things that is bad in the middle. Maybe the, there's no proper ratio of population representation. Now, these numbers might be a little difficult, but let's, let's try to attend. Representation of the House House is, is capped by law in 1910 at 435. That's all we got in that. Given a population of some 310 million, that makes one representative for every 710,000 people. When we have 435 representatives, a million people, 435 million, that'll be one representative for every million people. Write your congressman. Let your views be known. <laughs> <laughs> well, could we increase the size of the House? No. Because if you look at legislative bodies around the world, 435 is about right. It gets too big. Uh, it's going to be unwieldy. So that's, <coughs> that shouldn't be increased. But we got a problem. This thing is getting out of scale for representative government. If we, if the number of representatives, well, okay. Now Madison thought the ratio should be one for every 30,000 people. That's what he thought we should have, not one for every 710,000. But if that ratio were in place today, there would be 10,500 members in the House. <laughs> An unwieldy body. Or to take another view, if our current ratio were in place in 1790, 
there would have been only five members in the House of Representatives for nearly four million people. Mm -hmm. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have government of the people and for the people, but not by the people. What about the Senate? <coughs> well, when the people elected the senators, the legislators elected the senators, there was a kind of state nullification. But that's gone with 70 minutes. Or we can look at the matter in yet another light, and then this will be close to the end. A lawmaking majority in Washington, including the House, Senate, and President, is 269 people. That's all. Ruling 310 billion. And if Congress uses a quorum, you know what the majority of both houses is? 135 people. You think you could corrupt 135 people? Mm -hmm. Especially the sorts of people that go up there. <laughs> the central government will spend this year over six trillion dollars, an amount larger than the entire gross national product of Japan. If you take its public debt of sixteen trillion, add its debt, Social Security, federal pensions, etc., you get by moderate count. $75 trillion. That unimaginably large figure is equal to the gross domestic product of the entire world. $75 trillion. Never in human history has so much financial power been concentrated in the hands of so few. Not in any empire in history, including the Soviet Union. But even worse, most of the federal laws we live under are not even passed by Congress at all, but by administrative agencies under the control of one man, the President. These vast, impenetrable bureaucracies with Orwellian names such as FSEC, EEOC, IRS, EPA, FDIC, and F -b 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 -b, on and on, um, they, make, they enable the President to buy the fourth will of Congress. Finally, much of American social policy is not made by the people in the state legislature or even Congress, but by nine unelected, politically well-connected lawyers. So the Lincolnian tradition <coughs> offers us very little in the way of checking federal tyranny should it occur. Of course, it would never occur. But should it occur? <laughs> should it occur? There is very little in that tradition to enable us to check. We are supposed to to trust in national elections and trust the virtue of Supreme Court justices. <laughs> uh, and the amendment process is shut out. Practically, forget it. OK, I think I will just stop there. of that sort, and they have to be factored in. But uh, the, 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 the means of communication were, were better than you would think about back then. Um, people had reputations they, you know, they, had, they had to maintain. If they, if they didn't maintain them, they could be shot to duel, uh, things of that sort. So it was a different world. But, but surely there's a limit. We can argue about what we can argue about what the ratio should be, and, and you're right, technology makes a difference if you can communicate. But all I'm saying is there's a limit, and when it's one for every million people, that <coughs> doesn't work. If it's one for 700,000 people, that doesn't work. Iceland is a, is a little republic, the oldest democracy in the West, with under 300,000 people. Uh, most of the top 10 richest countries per capita in the world are small states. Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, so on. So um, I would just ask, I would just say, there is a limit, and we can talk about what the limit is. And Madison thought it was one for 30,000. 
Dr. Livingston, I, uh, no I don't students. see any of the students. students are, um... <laughs> right, right. Okay. You, t you uh, touched on an area of about uh, being electability, electability. Yeah. You know, we had a congressman here that was here for 16 years, Bob Inglis, and uh, it seemed like uh, his rocket left the launch pad and uh, was started going sideways or something. And after 16 years, a lot of the people here said, you know, we need somebody different. Yes. Which basically what you were saying is almost impossible to have an incumbent who's been there for 16 years removed. So anyhow, uh, I'll tell you how this happened. And of course, a lot of other people were involved. This the friend of mine's retired state senator. He says to me, "You and I are going to go interview this guy who wants to be congressman." I said, "You got to be kidding me." He says, "Yeah, you and I are going to go talk to him because he's the solicitor of Spartanburg County." Yeah. So we went and met him at Hardy's, and we talked to him, and you know, so this you know this young fellow Trey Gowd, he says. Well, what do you think? I says, hey, I got no problem based on what you're saying. I says, I, I definitely know one thing, you're better, <coughs> better than what we have. So anyhow, you know, Christina Jeffries was one of the candidates. Yeah. Trey Gowdy, Bob Inglis, yeah. and, and, and two others. And uh, Trey Gowdy was elected, and, you know, he, 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 he devastated uh, Bob Inglis. Yeah. Bob Inglis wasn't too happy about this. It seems to me that it has to do with, with the, the states, too. South Carolina is a different place, and I, I, maybe you can address that issue. The upstate up here is, like, very conservative, and when these people decide they want to get behind somebody to either elect well, him or remove him, they, yeah. they put a lot of energy into it. I, I don't think I, I'm competent to talk about South Carolina politics. <laughs> uh, I'd rather stick to Jefferson and Lincoln. Okay. If you don't mind. We can, you, can, you can instruct me afterwards. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd, like to make I really I'd like to make a comment about the the, uh, the young man yes. about the yeah. about the the, uh, the the technology and the communication. Well, the, the big problem with Congress, it, it, even as big, is these folks uh, generate these laws and all these bills and don't read them, vote, and so. So that, that's just, it's kind of well, one of the things we need, we need to consider, in Madison's time, <coughs> the federal government just didn't do much. Uh, it was mainly the post office. I mean, that's where you saw it. You saw it at the Custom House in Charleston, New York, Philadelphia, you saw it at the post office. And beyond that, unless it was a war or something, you never saw any kind of federal thing. And that's the way Switzerland is. Uh, the little states of Switzerland spend about 95% of the revenue. Federal government spends about 5%. That's the way it, it should have been. And by the way, the Swiss Constitution of 1848 is modeled on the American system. <coughs> they kept it, we did um, So, so if you, you know, if the, if the central government isn't doing that much, as most everything is done at the state and local level, which is what it which was done, and not even at the state level, at the local level, then, um, you know, you've got Republican government. People voted. They were involved in politics, um, much more than they are now. Um, I would just say, uh, do you see a point where states would get too big for even that representation? I mean, California, like you said, has yes. seven million people. So would that Jefferson thought Virginia was too big even in his day. And Switzerland is a good example. Switzerland is a little over <laughs> half the size of South Carolina. It's got 27 little states, not counties, states. Those states determine citizenship. You can't be a citizen of Switzerland unless a canton accepts you. No canton accepts you, that's it. Uh, they have their own military force. Uh, every Swiss male, 18 to 40, is in the militia, has a fully automatic assault rifle at home. And you, can, you can buy anti-tank weapons and have them at home. I mean, don't you want your people to have anti-tank weapons? <laughs> and so the Germans come in. So, um, so and this, so the Swiss cantons are small. Some are just, I think one's 38,000 people, some are 500,000. So there is a system in which, as you, as you say, it's broken up into smaller states. And they pretty much govern themselves. Um, Jefferson thought that's the way Virginia should be. It should be made up of not counties, but more republics. Um, and New England states were that way at first. <coughs> They began to weaken those little towns. They had towns. They still have towns. They still have town governments <coughs> and little town resolutions to find the federal government. They still go out, but they've lost a lot of their power. 
Yes. I don't know if this touches on the Lincoln Jefferson idea, but with the, with the direct election of senators instead of states. With what? You know, with like the direct election of senators instead of the states. Yes, yes. Swing them. How has that affected the whole balance between state and national? Well, <clears throat> the way it was is that the legislatures elected the senators, right? So you could talk to your legis your state legislator uh, and push. Uh, you, you actually could meet him. Uh, so in that way, the, the election is closer to the people of the state. I know in Maryland, one of my friends in Maryland says that at that time it was understood there would be a senator from the eastern part of the state and one from the western part. So they, they saw themselves as having these two interests. Uh, and so they did that. Whereas now, the election of a senator is a national and international event. I mean, Clinton, Hillary Clinton just goes to New York. Carpetbagger and you know, <laughs> become senator. Why? She could have come to South Carolina or someplace else. Uh, she had no interest in the state particularly. I, I shouldn't say that. Most likely not. And understandably so. Yes. Let's continue along with the comments on Jefferson. Uh, I keep looking for anything that shows me that Jefferson considered himself a Democratic Republican instead of a Republican. You know, uh, I. Wasn't Jefferson a Republican, not, not a, in the sense of, his, uh, of the time, and not a uh, Democratic Republican? Uh, or have you seen where he, consider, he, he uh, uh, referred to himself as a Democratic Republican? I know Andy Jackson did, but did Thomas Jefferson or James Madison ever do so? And the word goes, democracy was a bad word for right. him. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jefferson would talk, he said, I am not one of those who distrust the people. Right? So he, the people should be sovereign and they should have the last say. But who did he mean by the people? He didn't mean just any uh, wino that gets the vote, you know, any um, illegal immigrant that might get the vote or something. He meant, he meant people who are substantial members of the community. We can argue as to how you define find those people, right? Yeah. But, but they were the ones that the public that, that, that mattered, and uh, um, and you could extend the franchise, but when you extend the franchise, you should be sure that the sorts of people that were being included were the sorts of people that could make good, more or less good judgments, uh, just as you want a doctor that can make good judgments. Right. In your studies, though, when's the first time that you've come across, or have you ever come across Jefferson referring to himself as a member of the Democratic Republican Party? Well, I don't, I don't, I can't, I'm yeah, drawing I, a blank, I, 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 uh, I don't, I'm not that tight a Jefferson scholar, I don't know that much, I mean, I, you know, I know something about Jefferson, but right. I don't, uh, I mean, the term democracy was sometimes used loosely, but on the whole, when people are on their guard, see, because democracy just meant to vote a majority, right. and Lincoln uses the term, he, he'll use that, well, he used the word Republican, you know, the Republican Party is really a democracy party, mm -hmm. it can basically call it. Um, so the terms get turned upside down. It's like the Bolshevik party is called a majority party, but it wasn't. Yeah. Dr. Lewis, do you believe that the uh, due process was followed in the ratification of the 14th Amendment? Uh, in the ratification of the 14th Amendment? Uh, well, the rat I, think, I think it was never constitutionally ratified. The 14th Amendment was never constitutionally ratified for the very simple reason that what Congress did, see, I, see Lincoln's theory very briefly was that, that the states can't secede, like the county can't secede. So the war was a fight against pirates who had taken over the government. But once the pirates were eliminated and Union people put into southern states, then everything was back to normal. Well, that happened. And those Union southern states voted to abolish slavery. And they were counted, the states needed. When the 14th Amendment came, they, Union and Southern States, voted against it. So it didn't pass. So Congress said, we've got to do something. So they got rid of the states. They destroyed 10 states. They literally destroyed the governments of 10 states. So Virginia, the first representative body in the Western Hemisphere, known as the mother of presidents and the mother of states, was defined as military district number one. That's all Virginia wants. It was an aggregate of individuals under military law the whole state. So that's how they got the 14th Amendment passed. They got rid of the states that were in the way. Think about that. 
When people look at other countries and say it couldn't happen here, they forget that it did happen here. It actually did. Uh, but we don't want to, you know, we don't teach our students that. <laughs> so, no, I don't think the 14th Amendment was ever constitutionally ratified. Um, and some others don't, too. I, I think Mississippi ratified it in 1970 something. <laughs> I remember reading that, that Mississippi just ratified the 14th Amendment <laughs> to do it right. Wouldn't it have ramifications today? <coughs> Politically, it will have no ramification. Um, I mentioned this to a judge one time. He said, well, it was deemed ratified. <laughs> Congress said it. Congress said it was ratified. So, this is what happens when when the when the constitutional barriers <coughs> break down and, and raw political action occurs. It often can stick, whether it's rational or not. And this is why you have to constantly guard against liberty. And this is why we need to understand our history. We need to understand our history is much more complicated than, than most of us have been taught. Since we have a compact with you sovereign students to end this at 8 o'clock, uh, yep. we have time for one more question. This gentleman here has had his Regarding state succession, shouldn't when the states have, when they uh, ratified the Constitution and other states decided to join the United States, shouldn't that have been like entering a contract to, like, like whether it's with like a lease and you have to be co-signed or whatever, like you enter a contract with these other states, states not to, <coughs> succeed from each other. Like, I don't see where succession is like a viable option. Well, see, they're, they're, first of all, if you look at contract law going back 800 years, back, back to English common law, there is no such thing as a compact that is not uh, capable of rescission. So one principle in law is that, is that it's a perpetual rule of law that no contract is perpetual. Okay? Every contract is open to the equitable remedy of rescission. Now in the case where sovereign states are in compact, there's no authority above them. See? So it has to be with the states themselves. <coughs> the new states that came in, your idea might be that, well, maybe the 13 states were sovereign, but the new states that came in from the territories, they were different. Some people have argued that, but they weren't. And, and not that the Supreme Court has a final say, but it has ruled in a number of cases all the states were on equal footing to the 13. Didn't, didn't they create a level above them by making the United States of America like the actual federal government? The federal government has only the powers that the states delegated to it through the compact. If the, con if the Constitution is a compact between sovereign states, the question then is, what does the compact do? It gives the central government enumerated powers Madison said they're few and enumerated, and the central government has no powers beyond those. The states have all powers of sovereignty that are not prohibited to them. The central government has only the, in other words, if it's not in the Constitution, the central government doesn't have the power. And with the states, it's the other way. If it's not prohibited, the states have the power. That's the relationship. <laughs> so they did not create a sovereign central government. That's the British model. Parliament is sovereign. And that is what Lincoln, the Lincolnians, tried to get across, try, try to make Americans believe. Now, there's an interesting book by a Lincolnian fan, Gary Wills, called Lincoln at Gettysburg. Have heard of the book, any of you? No. Heard of Gary Wills. Yeah. Well, in that book, Gary Wills says, in the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln performed the greatest open-air swindle in American history. <laughs> because he described a, feder a federation, which is a compact between the states, as a national unitary state, <coughs> which it wasn't. <coughs> it was a swindle. But Will says he likes the swindle <laughs> because he prefers that kind of government over the federated kind. And, and you might do that. In other words, you might think that the Constitution of Framers made was not a good one and that we ought to have a different one. And that view began to be expressed in the early 20th century. Woodrow Wilson wrote a book on this, and he said, the South was right in law, but wrong in history. The North was wrong in law, but right in history. In other words, the Constitution was an egg like a chick with a chick in it, and the chick <coughs> broke loose. Progress and everything just broke loose from this 
old, antiquated 18th century constitution, but the South was right about the shale, but wrong about what was moving inside it. Well, that's a mystical way of talking. That's, that's, but the point is, we have this, we've inherited this fractured memory. This is what I'm trying to get across to you, that you, everybody here, and there's no exception, including me, everybody's inherited both of these traditions. You cannot read the U.S. Constitution and see the Lincolnian thing vindicated, unless you're dishonest. And this is why Wills is so right, that it was a great swindle. But he likes it. So he said, look, it's work, it's good, so let's just forget it. Well, that's okay, that makes sense. I don't agree with it, but I can understand. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Livingston would be glad to answer any other individual questions you might have. So why don't we uh, let the group, let, let the group, uh, thank you very much.